Let's start talking about microphone pickup patterns. Which direction microphones pick up? Some mics are very directional, some are not. There's three main types of microphone pickup patterns. The omnidirectional, which picks up equal in all directions. Bidirectional, where it picks up in opposite directions, opposite 180 degrees from each other. And unidirectional, where it usually picks up primarily from one direction. In the studio, there are microphone configurations that you can do with bidirectional and omnidirectional. For example, uh, let's say we're miking up a roundtable discussion for a television show, and we're left with one microphone in the center of the table. You want it to be omnidirectional. Let's say we're picking up the ambience in a room. You'd like it to be omnidirectional. Problem is, is it'll pick up from the ceiling as much as it picks up from the floor, as much as it picks up from forward and backward, and sometimes you'll pick up air ducts or foot traffic, and you'll pick up sounds you don't really want to record. In general, in the studio, I use unidirectional microphones, which are in one direction primarily. There are methods of miking that use bidirectional as well. For example, let's say you've got one microphone and you've got two vocalists, and you want them to sing a duet. And you put the microphone between them, and they both sing into the same microphone. You can make it bidirectional so it picks up each vocalist. If I'm in that kind of situation, generally speaking, I'll use a microphone that picks up in one direction, but put them standing side by side, and let them step up to the microphone a little more when it's time for them to sing. But I can't say that. Sometimes people like to watch each other when they sing in unison or sing together. So having a bi-directional mic is great. Or two unidirectional mics, one for each. There's a, a multitude of ways of picking up what you're trying to record. So I don't generally find a lot of use for omni and bi-directional. But we will talk about microphone techniques that involve both of those. Generally speaking, I'd say 80 to 90% is unidirectional. Pickup patterns. So three general polar pattern categories, omni, bi, and unidirectional. In unidirectional, there are subcategories of cardioid, supercardioid, and hypercardioid. Let me show you a little bit of what these look like. So here's an omnidirectional pickup pattern. So the three-dimensional drawing here helps you appreciate how it picks up. And the way that it's represented in, say, you're buying a microphone and you get the technical literature that comes along with it, it's represented in this way here. It shows you the directions it picks up. And usually these polar patterns are for one kilohertz. But you see from this polar pattern that as you go down in frequency from 20,000 hertz, 15,000, 10,000, 5,000, 1,000, it becomes less directional. This ties into what we were talking about when our ears can pick up directionality. Low frequencies, microphones, almost all of them become omnidirectional. But at high frequencies, they all become more directional. Most of these polar plots, these are called polar plots, showing the pickup directions, are based around the basic frequency of one kilohertz. So you can have a way of comparing microphones. Bidirectional or figure eight, it's sometimes called. Equal pickup from the front and the back, rejects most at the sides. So you see the polar pattern, how it looks. Cardioid polar pattern. Now it's called cardioid, as you can see here, this shape here, kind of starting to resemble a heart. It picks up primarily in this direction over here, it rejects sound from behind itself. This is a cardioid. Picks up most from the front, rejects most from the back. Supercardioid, on the other hand, is more directional in the front, but has a little bit of pickup in the back. So it's starting to look a little more like a bidirectional microphone, but it's really still focused primarily to the front, even more heavily than a cardioid microphone. That's supercardioid. Hypercardioid is even more directional forward, but it also has this little bit of directionality in the back that it picks up from. Hypercardioid, when do you pick up a hypercardioid microphone versus a regular cardioid? And that would be in a situation where you really want to focus a microphone at one specific sound. Here's a handy chart that will help you understand it. And you notice that when you go from cardioid to more directional in the front, it becomes more bidirectional to the point that it eventually becomes bidirectional. So I'll tell you quite honestly, 99% of the microphones I use are just cardioid. And of course, all the microphones have specialized options depending on what kind of microphone, what manufacturer, and so on and so forth. High-pass filters to eliminate rumble or somebody tapping their foot as they're singing. You don't want to pick that low-frequency rumble up. A pad to reduce the level 
coming into the mic so it doesn't distort, multi-pattern switches so you can take one microphone and change patterns. Most of the good microphones have that option. So you can combine two patterns and create a new one. Here's an example. Some of the very good microphones actually have two diaphragms inside so that you can combine them and create different polar patterns. Here's another example. Position one is cardioid, position two is omni, bidirectional, and super cardioid. So you can create whatever polar pattern you want using two diaphragms. Polar patterns come along with all the technical literature you can find online for any microphone, and mostly it has to do with what direction it's going to pick up. Pressure zone microphone. This is a PZM microphone. It uses a sub-miniature condenser capsule facing down to a reflecting plate. You're trying to capture a surface, and sound hitting that surface actually moves the microphone and creates the sound. It's the kind of microphone you'd use, say, in an acoustic guitar, PZM-type microphone. It uses a secondary boundary as a reflecting plate for the sound. Some sound very good, though. I, I actually, in a live situation, used to use two of these inside a piano because they sounded good and they rejected sound better from other instruments. They're worth looking at and experimenting with. Last but not least, stereo microphone built to try to simulate what your ears would be like. I don't adhere to this principle. Some people think that every sound that's recorded should be in stereo because we hear in stereo because we have two ears. Some people have tried that where they've done every sound in stereo. And because we're creating different sonic pieces that actually eventually get blended together into a stereo picture, I think that it's kind of overkill to create every sound in stereo and then try to mix them. For example, bass guitar or bass synthesizer, why would it ever have to be in stereo? I can't even hear where it's coming from in terms of directionality, and there's no reason it needs to be in stereo. Kick drum, same thing. There are sound elements that I just believe sound better when they're mono and positioned in a sound field that's stereo in my mix. People do all sorts of crazy stuff with microphones trying to simulate what our ears would be like. And I think that sort of comes back to the principle that our ears are in stereo, so everything we hear is in stereo, so we should record everything in stereo. And I think when you're breaking something down into its sound elements and then recreating a mix in stereo, each sound element that it's broken down to can be a mono sound and actually sound better, I think. Windscreens, pop filters, shock mounts... Those are all accessories in the studio that mostly you probably wouldn't use in a live situation. The windscreen and pop filter really doesn't affect the sound quality of what the singer sounds like as much as it protects the microphone from big blasts of air. Pop filter meaning when you hit a P, that burst of air can really rattle a sensitive microphone. What they try to do is break up that burst of air by going through a piece of cloth of some sort. That's what they're typically used for, but I find when I'm working with a condenser microphone and I'm singing or somebody's singing into a condenser microphone, if they sing directly into the microphone, naturally our breath has humidity in it. And because it has so much humidity, what happens is it hits the cold capsule, which is metal, and just like I don't know how many people are from cold environments, but windows that freeze up in the winter because it's cold out and there's humidity in the room, or like uh, the mirror when you take a shower, it gets foggy with humidity. And that's because the air is humid and it's hitting a colder surface and condensing on it. And that's what can happen to the microphone capsule with a singer singing directly into it with humidity in their breath. It doesn't immediately affect the sound even though it does because it adds more mass to the capsule because it's got little humidity beads and it's so small, it's not like drops, it's very, very small amount of humidity that collects there. The worst thing though is that after the singer finishes singing, the mic's hanging there, any dust particles that are floating around in the air that accidentally float into the microphone, they'll stick to it. And then all of a sudden your capsule starts getting dirty with dust. After about four or five years of using the same microphone, you don't perceive that it's sounding not as good, but it starts losing high frequency response because you're putting more mass on the diaphragm, which makes it less sensitive, which in turn means that it can't pick up as high frequency.